Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. We talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Hello, welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm your host, Darren Bresnitz, a big shout out and thank you to everyone who signed up and is reading Snacky Tunes, the newsletter out on Substack, coming out every other Monday. It's been great to see all the positive responses, so we're super appreciative of that. If you want to hear the behind the scenes story or have any episodes featured, please do not hesitate to reach out. We are over the moon to welcome back one of our first guests, George Motes, who's coming back for a long overdue chat. George, a.k.a. the Burger Scholar, shares so many delicious tales from what he's been up to since, I would say, the last decade when he was on. He talks about his new book, The Great American Burger Book, the opening of his new restaurant in New York, Hamburger America and how his TV show Burgerland still stands up today. Then we head into the archives when we had Brooklyn pop dance duo Crush Club on. They talked to us about how funk and Latin style percussion influences their music, how they've had a strong following with popular singles like Louder and We Dance, and they get into depth about dance lyrics and the all-important bass bod. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes here on Heritage Radio Network.
George, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you back to Snacky Tunes. You were on, and I had to look it up, um, episode 134 back in October of 2012. You were in the first couple of years. I know. And I got to say, I still think finally about that conversation. And I'm not just saying it because I'm looking at you now, but uh, I was like, man. 2012? Get- yeah, 2012. I How- can't even think back that far. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> man. was that? Uh, we were in Brooklyn. We were in the sheds. Yep. Um, it was about the food film festival, but you've done so much more since then. But how have you been? I mean, I've been following along with everything you've been up to, and we're going to get into some of that. Uh, how have you been? I've been great. I've, I've been great. Good to see your face. It's really yeah, good to see, to see your, your face. face, but I can see your face. It's good to see you, bud. Yeah. So we had you on, like I mentioned, to talk about the food film festival, which was such a big uh, movement and such a precursor of what was to come in sort of short film food as the focus and storytelling and things like that. Like no one really could foresee what was going to happen with social media, which is so no. much of what I think the food film festival tapped into. Um, I but appreciate s- that. But since but- then you've become like the preeminent burger expert in America, if not the world, when did that shift happen how did you start moving from like the food film guy to like the number one burger man well the funny thing we were just talking about this because the burger thing and the food film festival thing actually happened at the same time that that i do remember but but one started to eclipse the other a little bit it's true one one did start to eclipse the other one um because they started to come together and then they kind of split apart yeah the festival became enormous um we started selling out every event we did we sold out immediately which is great. It was a very exclusive event. I mean, it only you can only feed and show films to 300 people at a time and for five events in a row over five days. So it was fairly exclusive, but it still, it took on a life of its own. It mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. But the hamburger thing became more hyper-focused mm. um, and I just became um, on me and less about the burger. <laughs> it was weird because it became less about the burgers and, or maybe say equally so about me and my knowledge and what I knew. And then something very strange happened about 2018. I was approached by First We Feast, 
Mm-hmm. And they said, we're, we're looking for some uh, – we need some information on hamburgers. We have a – we already have a hosted show called The Burger Show and we need we need a <laughs> – I hate to say it. We need an old sage <laughs> basically to come in and uh, sort of be our – our, you know, our, our historical context to great mm-hmm, hamburgers mm-hmm. in America and the world. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, let me think about it. And I got back to them right away. And they put me on one episode and without telling me, it's a true story. I was on a plane to Brazil. Um, and when the, when the actual episode dropped on First Few Feast where I was featured as the – ready for this one? The actual title they gave me was The Burger Scholar. <laughs> I mean that's pretty good. It worked. No one good. told me that. And then I started getting emails and phone calls. Like by the time I landed, I had like 20 emails about who do you think you are? The, well, I can't believe you're calling yourself the Burger Scholar. I didn't call myself I the didn't Burger call Scholar. That. It was Chris. It was all of them. Just yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> come on. I wouldn't do but, it. But now that it's out there, yeah. I guess I am the Burger Scholar. I'd love to not – wear the crown, but if the crown's being put on my head. Exactly. That's basically what I said. And it, I would say it kind of took off from there, that like sort of phase two of my hamburger life, because I, I tell you what happened was very simply, I picked up a whole new generation of uh, fans. Mm. Uh, I, I have a generation of fans now that span, at one point it was like, it's basically like, you know, people look kind of like me, a little bit overweight, glasses, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just started to go into some women actually, which is fascinating. Um, and then also younger kids. I mean, I had, I have fans that, um, that now think I'm funny, but they're, they're 14. I mean, if, if I could ever be funny to teenagers, what a dream. That's the ultimate goal. Um, you've, you've always done this really great job of combining the media part with the food part and then the actual cooking and like the tactile tasting of it. Um, why was that, dual if not triple path of combining it all together so important to you how did you see that obviously now looking back that like full 360 immersive thing is a no-brainer in some ways but you knew this 10 years ago longer yeah i i we truly all of us who worked in the food film festival really believed in the, the multi-sensory experience that was food uh, i don't think people were not really talking about what it was like to experience food I, i've always been fascinated with foodways not just in the u.s but all over all over the planet um, and trying to figure out how those food wa- foodways became specific to that region or that that type that that you know that that group that population or whatever mm-hmm. on how ingredients have shifted you know uh, all the ways that like for example pasta um, and you know have, have has gone all over the world and where did it begin and where is it now it's all very fascinating stuff for me I love looking at foodways and the best way to just to explore that kind of stuff are two ways obviously well three ways one to actually get out there and eat it and do it and find it yeah, yeah. if you don't have the option to do that you watch a film and you learn from content um, and this goes this, this goes back to the beginning of the food film fest you'd watch something and you'd say to yourself I wonder what that tastes like or what mm-hmm. it smells Mm-hmm. like or how are they making it or i never knew you could use that ingredient for that and then while you're actually having that thought and what we did at the food film fest obviously was we mm-hmm. you know we gave you that that experience right in your seat yeah um i think it was obviously fairly unique because at the begin at the time nobody there was no i don't think instagram existed when we <laughs> i mean we it was it was in its early days but it wasn't you know it was like oh here's a sunset i'm gonna put a filter on it and like there we go that's my post yeah. it's not like i'm gonna right try and scam a restaurant for food and I'm going to shoot a, you know, a sandwich and some chips or something like that. Right. And stand on a chair with a big light and everything. Oh yeah. 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 Now don't get me started. Oh my God. We don't have enough. That's another podcast. So, you know, listen, I, I know you, you may have not written the title of burger scholar. Um, and that was dawned on you, adorned on you, but you did write one of the great books on Burgers called the Great American Burger Book. What made you want to get into writing a book about hamburgers? What do you think hadn't been said at that point uh, that needed to be brought together through your perspective? Well, first you made a film called Hamburger America. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was actually I started production on that in twenty. I'm oh, sorry, tw- yeah, two thousand one. <laughs> Whoa, uh, and we finished a it. Burger Odyssey. Yeah, Burger Odyssey. So it was. It was. I it profiled eight different uh, hamburger restaurants in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it premiered in two thousand four in Chicago. At the, I've never forget the MCA. I was just looking at photos of that just now. Wow, it was funny. I was a baby. I'd had very dark hair and big dark bushy sideburns. <laughs> sideburns look good. The hair looks good. Look, I have no hair left. So like, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When the film came out, 
right away people started to ask my opinion of hamburgers, and I was saying, "No, I'm a I'm a filmmaker. I'm not a I'm not a hamburger mm-hmm. guy." And I said, "Well, you, you've been to these places." And someone asked me to roll my research research into a book called Hamburger America, which came out I think 2007, I think. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of the beginning of the you know people taking me seriously, or me taking the burger seriously, and watching people take the burger as seriously as as I did. And it just it just grew from that that point on. Yeah, yeah it's been so interesting because you've been in the media food landscape or even just being like so deep on even something that could be seen as esoteric as a burger right and now it's like you have whole business models of restaurants this yeah is where we get our bread this is where we get the cheese this is the pedigree of the beef it's truly amazing it's yeah. truly yeah. amazing um what is there it was like- a turning point though i'll tell you what there was a turning yeah, point yeah, I was gonna ask. for sure yeah i'll tell you what it was was in 2010 i was asked to Speak uh, and uh, speak at the at National Archives in Washington D.C. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. about the history of the hamburger, uh, and specifically, uh, they wanted to show my film Hamburger America and bring it into the collection as permanent collection at the at the archives, National Archives. So oh, that's pretty interesting. So mm-hmm. I got down to give my speech, and I thought, here I, I was always giving these raw, raw, raw speeches, like this is why we need to save the American hamburger. And but I realized that when the guy who introduced me gave his introductory speech and br- to bring me on the stage. He was very – he basically took my old speech that I had planned sure. and talking about how – why we need to save you know, a food way uh, as important as the American hamburger. And I said so – I just ripped, I went, ripped it up and said, OK, <laughs> <laughs> my job is done here. And I realized at that point, everything had changed. Everything had switched mm. at that point. Everything. It's pretty fascinating. So having the book being lauded like that, how did you parlay that into – your TV show Burgerland, because that is, as you mentioned, and what you alluded to before, yes, it's about the burgers. Yes. It's about the location, but you said it, it became a little bit more about me, which is again, like you could find no offense to you or anything. It was like, you could find a lot of people who know, or at least pretend to even know burgers and go around to be a personality. How did you get the job? How did you fill that slot? How long did it take for you to feel like you really had become that scholar? Oh, uh, I'm <laughs> become a scholar. <laughs> I don't think I ever really realized it until the Burger Show came along and told me that I knew I knew who I was and I knew that I had some value, valuable information. I won't tell you who, but a lot of people in the industry who are big, big names, including you know, not just people but also industry you know, industry heavies, you know, big burger heavies, reached out to me for my opinion. Uh, I knew that at that point I was probably I was on my way to um, you know. I really needed to make sure I boned up and study what was going on yeah. because people were asking my opinion. I mean, I was asked by a lot of writers, I, without giving names, TV celebrities um, who would ask me my opinion and, and say, can I please borrow your film or whatever? Or I, can you please come and speak for me? Or can I was, I consulted for all the big guys without giving names again. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. I realized at that point that I definitely had an opinion that it was worth it. That so was good. But then how does that become a TV show? Because I think a lot of people – focus on a topic and think that they can make that jump, but that's not how it always happens. It was uh, a little strange the way it happened. Um, the short story was that we, just, a friend of mine who was a producer in Hollywood, in LA, he said, I would like to make a pilot. I think you've got something here. I think you could make a great show. And I said, okay, fine. Let's try to make a show. And we shot a pilot. Uh, we pitched it to a bunch of networks and I think like 12 networks all said no. I said, okay, it's over. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I got a very bizarre phone call um, about six months after we sent our pitch tape in, and it was a, it was a producer from the Travel Channel saying, um, "Would you like to host a show for us?" And I said, "Uh, is the show about hamburgers? Because I don't know anything else." <laughs> and they said, "No, the show's about America." I said, "I'm confused. Okay, how did you get my name?" And they said, "Well, we found your pitch tape, and we saw yours, and we threw everything else in the garbage. We want to, we want you to host the show." Wow. So what's the show called? He said, "It's called Made in America." I said, "You'd be perfect for the job." I said, okay, um, I don't know the show. Oh, wait a minute, you mean the show with, with what the, the the guy from Cheers? <laughs> show. And I said, yeah, we're actually doing a reboot of the show. We'd like to have you host the show. I said, oh my God, I'm in, done, say no more. I said, but here's the deal though. I would like to also, I, said, I would like you to consider the burger show that I pitched you guys for in the yeah, first place six yeah. months ago. And they said, we'll make you a deal. You do one season of Made in America and then we'll shoot a, a, a real pilot um, for your show. And that's how it started. Uh, we did the, f- the full season of Made in America. The show got canceled. <laughs> Not my fault. <laughs> Not your fault. No. It wasn't even your show. It wasn't even my show to begin with. We had a great time. It was, it was a really good show. We ended up visiting 36 factories in, in a, like tw- 13 episodes. Had, I had the greatest time. I've always wanted to go back and do that show somehow, but do it with hamburgers. Mm. Um, 
with me and hamburgers and factories in America would be that's that's fascinating. But then we made the a double pilot um, and mm-hmm. it took off. It rated really really well. They called me. I never forget. They called me on them on it was I think it, they aired on Sunday of Labor Day weekend. Something stupid like that, and it really did well. Surprisingly, they said they said it did not expect it to do well at all. <laughs> oh, don't you love that? Hey, we thought this would tank. We do not believe in <laughs> you. Really and much to our chagrin, here we are calling you. Tuesday at eight, nine o'clock in the morning, the phone was going crazy, and they said we wanted, we need to do more episodes immediately. Get on the road, and so we did. And that's Amazing. how it happened. Amazing. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the series, and then talk about you cooking burgers, um, and about your book that's that's about to come out, along with your restaurant. Here's a song from the archives on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network. I dream about you all the time. You might be on my mind when time was turned. Being tired by the boat of a fragile mind We hoped we might make it out alive To live, to tell the tale of age Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We have hamburger expert, TV host, film festival curator, author, George Motes. And before we left, we're talking about the initial success and rolling out of your TV series, Burgerland. So the network had obviously slotted you into the show as talent for the other series, but this was really yours and and your vision. Did you get to go to the places you wanted? Did you get to be you? Were you playing a character? Did you, you know, how much of it was the show you wanted to make? It's funny. I would say 98% of it was the show I wanted to make. 
which I, you know, wow. was pretty rare. Well, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you what happened was I had one of these straight. I, the advice I give everybody who who has to approach, yeah. uh, you know, a meeting room full of you know television executives, the one advice I give everybody all the time is that when you walk into that room, it's your show. Don't forget mm-hmm. that. And your opinions are actually more valuable than theirs. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I never thought that. I thought, oh, I'm just going to be this sort of puppet. I, that's okay. I, I want to be on te- television. Cool. And they're going to tell me what to do. But the minute I started to have an opinion, they mm-hmm. started taking notes. Mm. And that's that's the shocking part. The people don't expect that ever. They just assume like, oh, I'm just here to like, listen to the executives. I mean, I, I don't think it's like that with every every network out there. I'm assuming, I'm assuming Food Network has their own you know, very, very strong opinions. Yeah, I know does. they do. Everyone does, but if you have, if you voice an opinion, uh, they listen to you. And b- believe it or not, the show that we've actually, the tr- the trailer that we made, the trailer, the, the actual sizzle reel we made, is almost identical to the show. Nothing really changed. They did, they added one act to it, I think, and we added obviously the graphics and all the sure, sure, t- sure. title treatment changed. Other than, that, other than that, the show, the show we wanted to make, we actually made. Which I find fascinating, and one of the problems I had with the uh, with uh, Made in America originally on Travel Channel was that some factual stuff was getting kind of mixed up, and I would try to make it a make it a, make a point to say, "Hey, this is not 1927, 1923, and it's that's okay. We're through the edit, <laughs> okay." <laughs> well, <laughs> and so I made sure that we did we did uh, Burgerland. It was going to be factually perfect all the way through. Well, especially um, so that's I was, the I was, reputation I was a producer. as well. You know. Yeah, that's what I said to them. I said, you can't do this. The other thing that we changed about the show was that I sat down in a meeting room with all the production, the production company at that point, and I said, I want to make this show a very specific way. I want you to think of up no res- at the time, no, no reservations was doing really well. Yeah. And I said, it needs to feel very conversational. So I want to take the cameras and don't put them wide angle right in front of our faces. Get them back. Oh, across yeah. the room. Just pick me off across the room. Pick the, pick off the you know the chef and the talent, whoever we're talking to at the counter. From across the room, so they don't know we're having we're having this conversation. And of course, we ended up with a lot of great stuff. That was one thing I said to them. I said the second thing I said: the food shots have to be amazing. Yeah, people have, have to want to eat their screen. Period. And yeah. um, they they said, well, you know, we only have an hour at the end of the day slotted for tabletop and food shots. Said, Not enough. I would say the afternoon. I would shoot interviews in the morning, lunch, yep. and, and food shots the afternoon. They are crazy. <laughs> I mean, but that's that's you know again what yeah. is now second nature where you got to book out a couple of hours, have a yeah. setup, things like that. Especially when you're shooting the same beauty in in the grand yeah. scheme of things, you're shooting a burger every time. Which to yeah. us, you're like, well, this has fried onions, and this is a cheeseburger, and this is a triple burger, and you're going like, these are all very different. To a lot of the times, to people who are watching, it's like this is the same. It's just a hamburger. I don't, you know, right? So you got to make so really, yeah. stand out. You had to find a way to make the shot look great all the time. But also what happened was when you, the more you shoot the, the same shot over and over again and you, you start to explore, oh, I can probably do this as a different shot. This looks better. And you also get the – I got the crew really into it. Like they actually got into it. Let's try this shot. Let's yeah. try it coming overhead. We're you know, zooming in or if we're coming across on a – we had this like skate wheel dolly we, we picked up at one point. And it was – we they, it actually forced the crew to keep – pushing further and think of different cool, fun food shots and then get closer and closer and, and have, just have fun with it. Yeah. I mean, it was a great show. I remember when it came out, I loved it. And obviously it's not going on now. It, 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 it got canceled at one point, which is never a great feeling, but that didn't keep you from being on screen. What made you want to stay on camera and how did you chase that opportunity as well? Even after the TV show went away, yeah, well, it went away because the there was a big executive shift to Travel Channel. We tried mm-hmm. to negotiate with them, and they they basically cut my budget in half. And I said, "Well, yeah. we were actually, we were going to come and ask for twice as much." And <laughs> so they said, so, "And then once we in the middle of negotiation, we were considering doing it for less money, but then they they the whole I mean, Travel Channel uh, was absorbed by a larger you know company, and then everything." Went away, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is that's normal. That actually is very normal. I try to tell people also if you're when it's, you get it's into happening television. right now. It's it's, it's the same right the same changes in the industry are happening right now, and there's no way to control it. All you have to just do is you got you got you have to prepare yourself for you know. If I'm not invested, I'm freelance, so I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm good like this. Well, that's you know? the, the same advice when I give people who are getting into it. I go, people are like, oh, we got all this great stuff. We're going to save it for season two, and I was like, no. You do the best season for season one because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. You, it, you put it all up on the court. You leave it all out there. And that way when you look back and you go like we, we didn't hold back, then you yeah. go there's nothing else we could have done. 
I literally did the show I wanted to do. And we I look back and I say, you know, I like this show a lot. I mean, yeah. there's some stuff I would have changed, but you know, yeah. again at that point, it was so close. It was so close to what we really it was our vision. I mean, honestly, if you look at that, it really was our vision. It was kind of silly. It was very, very factual and, inf- and full of information. And and the shots were amazing. And also yeah. you could see from the show, we went everywhere. We went we had a, we no, went it was, we great. Were, it was really was, America. It was it, we could have done. Yeah. Look, I've done travel shows where you're like, cool, three LA episodes? And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. All right. So you're counting Brooklyn and Manhattan as two different cities. Okay. Right. Okay. 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 <laughs> So um, the production company was very – they're very smart about doing that. They said we need – it has to it has to have great production production value. Let's get out there and do a show, a real show. But So what kept you on front of camera? Because it's easy to be like, I did my show. I did – you know, I had this little first we feast thing and I'm good. I want to focus on other things. Well, I had a little bit of a dip there. We tried to – so at one point, I was a pariah. I mean, no, <laughs> nobody <laughs> wanted me – nobody wanted me to host their show on another, another network because I was already – I was old news from Travel Channel. Sure, right? I became sure. old news like overnight. It was really bizarre. It was a horrible that, – that was a horrible feeling. I did nothing to deserve it. I just – it was just a – I was just a product of, you know, of um, what was this this shift going on at Travel Channel. Um, but – a couple of years went by and I kind of forgot about it. I just said, nah, I'm okay doing what I'm doing. I was still filming. Yeah. I, I, was, I was a director of photography for 28 years of my life. Uh, and I was still doing that. So I was fine. I was totally happy. But then my agent came to me. <laughs> this is kind of where it all got sort of ramp up. And she said, my, my literary, my lit, lit agent, she said, you should think about doing a cookbook. And I was like, a cookbook? Mm. Come on. And that really put me in a whole different place. A really different place. I mean, that, when the cookbook came out, we did a we did a book tour, and that's where I got back our camera again because I remember the first. Tour. You yeah. remember the, so the first the first stop was in Seattle. We went to uh, it's called uh, it's called what's it called again? Fox. No, it's the Fox affiliate. I forgot what it's called now, but the Fox affiliate in in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a live morning show with two hundred sure. people in the audience. Um, it was hilarious because they said, "Okay, could you make a burger?" Um, and talk about it and talk to the host at the same time in front of an audience. You have seven minutes. <laughs> so, seven minutes? So what, that was the segment. So no, what, what I mean, we, that's, that's a lifetime for morning cook shows. It's normally like they give you three minutes right. and you've got to move through like eight recipes. Well, the question was – yeah, exactly. So I had to – what burger can you make and talk about at the same time Ooh. in seven minutes? Um, uh, it's uh, uh, the onion burger. How about the fried sure, onion burger? Sure. Lunch and I kind, of, I kind of pulled it out of my out of my ear and I said, oh, how about let's do this? And then – um. I looked it up in my own book and I said, oh, yeah, it's only got five ingredients. I could probably pull this off. <laughs> I think I and have a recipe on that. I think I have a, I think I have a recipe. Yeah. And that became the burger that, that I'm now associated with yeah. from that moment. It's yeah. called King. Fuck. It was called King Five was the morning show. Sure. Sure. Yeah, it was great. Great morning. Great morning. It was a, one of those like the classic like Seattle morning show with an audience and nailed it. I, 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 was, I was shocked at how good the burger tasted. I even like at one point you could see me reach out and grab the burger from the host when she goes, mm, this is really good. Oh, let me try that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you speak on a really good lesson is that this is all cyclical and yep. it all is experience and nothing's wasted. And um, there are some really low points, especially if you want to be in this game. Uh but now that you've sort of refound your footing and now that you've, let's just say you've aged into the scholar part of it from, from that point, you know, you have another book coming out um, and you have a restaurant that's about to, to open its doors. Yes. Where do you feel now about both those projects and how do you feel about sort of finding this, this second or even third act? When the cookbook came out, the, the next thing that happened was very interesting. Uh, I started getting um, – uh, people uh, reach out, reaching out to me from other around the world. I mean, other countries: uh, Argentina, Brazil, Japan, France. Uh, some really, I'm Sweden. Big, heavy, like burger countries. People, that, countries that love, absolutely love American burger culture. That was the next big thing that happened because I started getting asked to come and show up with some of these restaurants and, and countries and uh, cooking school. I got invited to a cooking school in mm-hmm. Sao Paulo. Uh, I, I got invited to a huge event in Japan. Um, I've cooked at restaurants all over the world now, and I've given instruction. I've, I get paid to give instruction on what what is an American hamburger. Wow! And what's happened is, I, ha- I mean, at one point I did I did an event uh, in Sao Paulo with 120 people in the audience. They paid paid a fair amount of money to actually be in the audience and listen to me talk about like where the best cut of meat is for hamburgers. Sure, on an sure, sure. A PowerPoint presentation with the, the headset on and everything, and I did an overhead you know cook camera you know uh, cooking demo for the audience and. I asked who in the audience, you know, had a restaurant, and it was almost almost eighty percent or eighty five percent of the rest of the audience 
that was listening to me, they had they already had their own restaurants going. Mm. And they came up to me and thanked me. One girl, I, true story, she came up crying and she said, it's because of you, you saved my life. I said, I didn't do anything. I just talked about hamburgers. I said, no, <laughs> yeah. no, you, you saved my life. You gave wow. me the inspiration to open a restaurant in Rio and now my life is much better. And and I'm, I'm still to, to this day, that was, that was probably seven, eight years ago. I'm still hearing these stories and I, I find it fascinating. I didn't do anything. I just offered you the you know, the, the, the window into my world. Mm -hmm, and I said, mm -hmm. people really take, some people really do take it very seriously. <laughs> it's just good. So that was the next big phase to watch the burger sort of explode around the world. Yeah. And now it's coming back on us. So then it's nice to see people make burgers and, and not, not credit me, but at least be thankful. The fact that they discovered this, you know, very sure. niche world of sure. hamburgers because of me. So that was the next big one. That was my next phase. And, and that's, that's sort of when the burger scholar thing came around. Yeah. Um, and then parlaying that into another book or the new book is interesting because people go like, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll do a reissue or we'll get this out of things like that. And so – and I, I, I know that the new book is dipping into uh, the old book a little bit, but it's great to see that you've been able to – update it and say that there's more to say about the burger. We're not just going to run it back. Like there's new things yeah. to share partially in some crazy way of what the groundwork you laid and then you helped inspire this next generation. And now they're like, there's new things to say about burger because of what people took from you teaching them or at least looking for your guidance. Yeah. We, I mean, we have now an international section to the book, which mm -hmm. I had to fight for. The mm -hmm. publisher couldn't mm -hmm. quite figure out, my editor couldn't figure out like why I wanted to do an international section. It's about, it's called hamburger. It's called hamburger America. It's called the great American burger book. I'd say, but yes, but we, we've discovered what we've, diaspora. we've been, yeah, we've exactly, we've been exploring the diaspora. We've been exploring how the hamburger has, has, you know, gone through, gone out into the world. Um, it came from Germany technically came to America, it became this thing in America, but it went back out into the world as an American hamburger. And that's fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating. And I've been all over the world, I've been a lot of places to see that actually happen and, and see how they've translated it. So it made sense to actually have, to, it made sense to actually have, you know, a, a section or a chapter of the book dedicated, devoted to international burgers. So now, it has changed. That, that, that's the good news about the book. The book has 20, I think 27 new recipes in it, but they're all based on, you know, historically significant hamburgers. Mm. Now, with the new restaurant opening, can people expect to taste some of these burgers at the restaurant, or is it a different focus? Hang on one second, I have to cough. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Um, yes, the answer is definitive yes. Um, the way it's going to work in the restaurant, there's basically three burgers on the menu. There's the burger that I've been making a lot called, you know, the Oklahoma fried onion burger mm -hmm. will be on the menu, obviously for sure. Which I love, I which yeah. I love that because it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, this is the burger I'm known for. This is the people that the burger that people want. I'm going to sell this burger. It's not a zag. It's not like a, uh, like I'll do this once a month. They're like, no, no, this is the business. Yeah. I have been, I've probably made 30,000 burgers uh, in the last four years. 30, sorry. I probably made. I've probably made 30,000 fried onion burgers in the last four years alone. Mm -hmm. Me personally, it's, it's been insane, but you know, people like them. So I make them. Um, the, the second burger on the menu, I'm just going to make a classic smash. I, mm -hmm. Even I get a little bored sometimes of the onion burger. I want something different, but classic smash is going to be, again, historically significant, histor historically accurate where it's going to be a, you know, a smash flat patty um, with a good crispy edge on it uh, with some uh, uh, chopped onion, mustard, and pickle. And that's it on a, on a toasted bun. Mm. That's number two, the third burger is going to be a rotating monthly special where I bring in one of my hamburger heroes from around the country or around the world, and we make their burger side by side at my front facing griddle in the restaurant uh, to you know PR and and fans and everything, um, and then Smart. we keep that burger on the menu for the month. And it could be the green chili cheeseburger from New Mexico, it could be the 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 olive uh, burger from Michigan. Uh, I've got I I have the first two years already figured out. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, but I got to imagine there's going to be a secret menu as well. Yes. There's definitely going to be a secret menu. Shh, don't tell anybody. I won't but, tell anybody. Um, the secret menu is actually in a way, my son and I figured it out. The secret menu is actually larger, I think, than the full menu. <laughs> of course. That's the way it's got to be. Um, we're doing this thing where we're saying, like, hey, if you can, we, we have a bowl of chili, obviously, on, on the, no, we have a bowl of chili on the menu. And if you... You know, do the math. Obviously, you think, oh, they have they have chili. 
they have cheeseburgers, I'd like a chili cheeseburger and it'll be on the menu. But it won't be on the written menu, but it'll be in the computer if you know how to ask for it. If you know how to ask for it. I mean, you know, there's this whole thing going on about, I don't want to say nostalgia, but like this idea of like diner and community. And, you know, I know that you mentioned that there won't be music during the day so people can really hear the sound of the space. Um, and people yeah. are really drawn to that. What what makes you want to lean into that sort of era or that feeling of a restaurant and cooking? It's a very simple answer is that every restaurant I've been to that is an authentic hamburger restaurant, I get a good feeling. Mm. I walk in and I have a great feeling and I, it makes me so happy to be in some of these places. And it's the conversations you have with people sometimes. It's the opposite of the food, the smells, the sounds, what it looks like. But it's more, it's even, it's just the, the overall feeling. It's kind of like, you know, it's hard to explain. Like if you, if you try to, um, like if you go to the islands, you have a, you know, you have a, a, like a tropical drink on the beach, you know, it always tastes better for some reason on the mm, beach mm. with the salt and salty air and the, and the warm temperatures than when you try to make it, you know, at home in your kitchen. It, never, it can be the same exact ingredients, just never taste the same. In fact, I just went on vacation at Turks and Caicos. And we got back on vacation. I brought with me the rum and I brought the, 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 the ginger beer. The it was the same damn drink and it didn't taste the same. This didn't taste the same. So no. to me, it's like you have to be in these spaces. And I'm trying to create a space that is experiential. That when you walk into the restaurant, you right away, you think to yourself, oh, this is familiar. I feel comfortable. I'm ready to eat. This is going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, now, look, I'd be remiss because I know that we – we met in Brooklyn and now I'm out in LA and I've seen you post a lot about the apple pan. Uh, and I'm not going to put you on the spot to be like, what is your favorite? What's the best? Cause each, what I like about the way that you treat burgers is like each one has its own merits, but like what I do respect about you is that you have not been like the LA burger scene is not as good as the New York burger scene or things like that. Um, when you crave a burger, if you could go anywhere right now, we'll take just this moment. Ooh. What city? Where would you go? Where would you have the burger right now? What's, what's oh, well, I can't. I don't play favorites. I can't do that. I'm not, I'm not saying favorites. I'm just saying in this <laughs> moment during this yeah. conversation, if you could go have a uh, burger, because it might change in the next hour. Well, to, to me, I, to, the my favorite burger that's the closest to me is the one I want to have. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, okay. Sorry. So okay. that's usually the way I, the way I play that one. Um, I I'd love to go down to Joe Jr. and get a burger, you know, mm -hmm. on, on you know on Third Avenue. They have a great great classic banging burger. It's so good, but the basic nothing to it. It's just a it's just beef on a bun, pretty much with a slab, slab of cheese. Um, uh, so it's hard. I can't play that. I can't play that. I can't love to. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. There are there are some good burgers. I, LA's got a lot going on. LA has a weird like cutthroat thing going on right now. I. I know. So, like, everyone's got to cool it out there. Woo, I, man, I know. It's, it's like the, the smash burger scene is so competitive here. Um, so competitive. So competitive. And it's it's like a – everyone's talking crap at each other. So they're all so smack talking. What's I going know. on? I know. <laughs> we don't have well, that here. No, well, because it's just there. there's – it, there's two it's burger saturation i mean i'll say it right. I, I, i'm I'm not gonna go on the record i know which one's my favorite but it's it's uh it's something where i'm like i won't even say it out in public because it's 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 too competitive <laughs> um well listen yeah, george i won't I, say it either yeah 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 i cannot thank you enough for for coming back on hopefully next time i have you back on it won't be 11 years um we'll, it's we'll, amazing we'll, we'll try and fit you in before then um uh but listen shout out the book shout out the restaurant shout out where people can follow along with your adventures the next uh, book is um, May 9th, coming up soon. Um, it's uh, the Great America Burger Book. It's the cookbook, but version two. The restaurant opens hopefully in July. That's the plan right now. We'll see. Um, I'm, I'm Actually, they, we do have to get it open by July. That's that's the next big one. And beyond that, I don't know. I mean, I've got – we're about to green light the next uh, Hamburger America book, which should be fun. Just wow. So you know. And yeah. name of the restaurant for those who missed it? David, the restaurant is Hamburger America. There you go. It makes it super easy. And if they want to follow along with your burger adventures, where can they go? Definitely to Moats Burger uh, awesome. on Instagram. M-O-T-Z Burger. Amazing. Well, George, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to your team for helping set this up as well. I'm so happy they reached out. It was great to see your name come through. We have a song from the archives and a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network.
when you read your rights All alone, but you know you can deal Anywhere that you know is right Can't pretend you need company When you know what your life can be Doesn't matter what you know, what conceals When you know what you realize Let me know what you know, what you see What you know when you read your rights All alone, but you know you can deal Anywhere that you know is right Can't pretend you need company We belong in the wreckage of fire We belong in the wake of desire We belong in the far apart We belong but we fall apart So hold my heart I know you've been lonely So hold my heart I know you can hear me I'll leave a trail so you can follow I'll leave a trail so you never get lost No And you need company We belong in the wreckage of fire We belong in the wake of the side We belong but we're far apart We belong but we fall apart So hold my heart I know you've been lonely So hold my heart I know you can hear me I'll leave a trail so you can follow I'll leave a trail so you never get lost Oh, we belong This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Welcome back. Crush Club. Hey. Live in Studio TC in the Chev. Hello. Yay! Uh, <laughs> th- you're the only one. It's like a, it's kind of a, like a name, Le Chev. Yeah. Uh, that's been around for a while. And sometimes, you know, you pick a name for yourself and you're like, man, that's like goofy. You know, after it's like a word that you just say over and over and over again. And after a while, it doesn't mean anything to you. And so I'm so glad you said it. And you said it right, and well, it's just nice. E- well, we've known each other for a long time. I know. So yeah. Lots I, I, of emails. You lo- know, actually. Well, I mean, bef- prior to Crush Club. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. like yeah, sweaty yeah. house parties in Brooklyn yeah. with Alex Pasternak of Y'all Lemonade. dated, huh? Well, yeah. I'm, I'm old. Well, this, I mean, the sun's still up. And we're listening to Fun's funk. Up. 
Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and disco and grooves. Yeah. I just texted my brother. This sounds like stuff we listened to when we were out. Yeah. 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 Right. Which is great. Feels Thanks, right. It feels I, right. I'd say definitely one of the motivating factors of Crush Club is like, that's what you want. Just do that. Yeah. I'm not like, um, I'd say we're not really going uh, head to head with FKA Twigs on yes. this project. We're having like a really amazing funk time. I remember. <laughs> yeah. All uh, smells. I remember when <laughs> yeah. I was at the end of DJing, it was when like, you know, and you're still four, you're DJing right now, kind of. Okay, yeah. Like four by four right. and heavy bass is coming out, right. and I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm gonna have to stop because I just don't like this, I, and, I, yeah. and, and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not gonna, and no one wants to hear the music I like anymore. So I guess I'm done. <laughs> and there are some people who are just like, you know, DJ with the times, and right. yeah. So it's like you can always tell when people like, because I mean, um, watching you two perform, it's like it could be two or two hundred or two thousand, and I and I'm totally. pretty sure it's the same performance. Yeah, Which yeah. means that you love it. Oh yeah, yeah, Deep yeah. Deep in yeah. the core. This, uh, if it, if it's you know 100 BC, this is the same. Even if we went back in time. Back in time. Well, probably <laughs> probably less amplified. Oh uh, yeah, more just <laughs> no. We find the Colosseum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sound bounces off the wall. It, it really does. Um, there there are a few words that I continue to see how Crush Club is defined: bold, sexy, oh, oh, reckless. Yeah. Instincts, body, anticipation. Mm-hmm. That just came from the chef's tinder. Move, <laughs> movement. Um, <laughs> movement. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> no, that's I, and I, but I can say it because, you know, you move, but you, you were giving great base face and great <sighs> mm-hmm. base body, yeah. which I think is a new era. What is it to, to be able to embody those words and kind of like, how does it take your music to kind of like both from the intangible and the tangible parts of words and then a feeling? That's such a good question. Um, t- f- let me just answer for you. Sure. No, I'm just, uh, <laughs> to me, it's like, you know, you go through music, you learn all this garbage. I f- studied so much shit. And th- especially this project, like music, so much of it is just magical. It makes you move in a way. And most people don't know, like, that's an A or that's a B. And to think about it is kind of dumb, too, you know? So. This is more like everything goes in, you learn all your stuff, and then just do it, whatever feels good at the time. And you'll know, like, it's not just dancing. I'm actually, I can't sing very well at all, but I, I do the, um, I do the, like, Oscar Peterson. I don't know if you ever, if you ever listen to Oscar Peterson. It's like, you know, he's a jazz piano player. And he's, uh, he sings along with his piano, and he sings all crazy. So it's like, it's this un- most unbelievable piano solo you've ever heard, and he's going like, <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm doing that also. So you're like, you're like backup yelling. I'm backup yelling, <laughs> I'm bass facing. I'm body, bass, body bass, bassing. Body bassing. That's a lot, that's a, and you're just singing, huh? I'm Get to work. Singing, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm just, I'm just grooving. Five checks for me. <laughs> One for him. Ten for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and when you're when you're making this music, you know, it's so easy for the lyrics to kind of be throw away or just kind of repetition. How do you match it? And you know, what are you saying within the music that that you know complements the uh, backup yelling? <laughs> <laughs> um, we spend time on our lyrics. Uh, no, we, obviously. <laughs> no, it's very obvious. That, that yeah, was a compliment. Very, I know. Yes, yeah, it's very, thank, thank it you might, so much. That might have not come out as a compliment, but it, yeah. it was. All right. <laughs> well, no, I, no. Think, I think we know that it could easily turn into that. And yep. so we try to be at least a little real and smart with the lyrics. And then <sighs> yeah. usually, you know, I've had a fun night and I come in and I'm just speaking gibberish. And then Cheever just turns it into English. Yeah. Very helpful. You know what's one of the we have one song that's that never saw the light of day that's called Marshmallow. I shouldn't even give it away because someone's gonna just steal it and make it a song. They owe us money already, and and uh, it was it was late in Paris, and our friend who's um, at the time pretty ESL um, guy from Brussels. And we're and we're like get messed up, and we're like let's go just jam, let's go make a beat. So they make a beat that's really slow and drunk, <laughs> and the hook just goes marshmallow, marshmallow, marshmallow. So oh, nice, so nice. <laughs> and it was the fucking jam, like it was really good. Yeah. So it's maybe not not out yet. Yeah. Coming, coming. You just sang the chorus, and then it makes in. sense for someone. <laughs> 
Someone, someone's gonna someone's use it. it. Yeah. Everyone we, loves marshmallows. Can we hear a song? A song. Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, let's do a song. What are right. you gonna play for us first? We dance. We dance. Which um, I don't know if we're gonna play later. There's also the remix of this song that's currently storming up the charts. BBC World One, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super mini, super mini remix. Thank you, Ramon. Ramon so good. Lopez. Here we go. Crush Club Live on Snack Tunes. I want to talk about 
the concept of a super mini remix because I've never come across that before. So what is a super mini remix and how much does it differentiate from the original before it goes into a super remix or a mini remix? Please educate. Oh, this is, uh, I wish it was something that we can, it was actually just somebody's DJ name. (laughs) But I'm, you know, okay. On that note, we have done a super mini, we've done like super mini EP, like where it just has like two seconds of every song and it's so disorienting and, but that's the advertisement for the EP. Um, anyway, yeah, this guy, Ramon, um, forgot his last name. Lopez. Ramon Lopez. Yeah. Um, Australian guy hit us up randomly, found the song. Um, you know, please let me remix, and we send him some. Of course, you know if anyone. What's crazy writes you is like that, that he yeah. was he was really eager, and I think like now today, when someone's really eager, you kind of like think, "What's up with this person?" Which is pretty screwed <laughs> it's up. It's really cynical, but yeah, I mean, it's but like sad. I know it's because right. before you're just like, "Oh, we're collaborating." Yeah, but now you're like, "What's what's the angle here?" Yeah, what, what's what's the game guy? Are you a real person? Like like are yes. you like a fourteen year old? But is this just some like is Russian? This, bot? Is, that, is yeah. this Lashev just like? Building Fucking, up confidence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sent this message to myself five years ago. So at the time, I'd be like, yeah, someone's listening. They love it. But it turns out, like, refreshingly, he happens to be someone who just likes music and reaches out to people. Mm-hmm. And I think he had, like, a remix, like, on the Billboard US dance chart. Like, he's, like, killing it. And uh, he's just super eager and, like, amazing. When we did remixes and, like, a million lifetimes ago, right. the last message I spent on sent on MySpace was to Licky Lee to be like a really big fan can you send me the stems for a little bit and she did like Amazing. right before and I was right. like like when you used to be able to be like hey I really like this can we remix it and she's like yeah here you go like that was an earnest time totally. yeah that is a long time right. ago yeah now it's like someone writes you like are you going to hack me and is this a phishing scam yeah are you just going to release the song like yeah. before yeah. it's out right yeah. and are you going to like take credit for it and then i have to be like no that's ours yeah. like yeah it's so dark do it people is. do that actually have you heard that someone is like hey let me remix this and they just release it and be like i wrote this song <laughs> that would be That's so a great aw- that, idea yeah oh how do we write this album we gotta we'll go. never tell <laughs> we'll never tell yeah can we hear another song? Yes. Please. What are you yes. going to play for us this time? What do you want to do, Chi Chi? Let's do Trust. Trust. Yes. Yes. What everyone needs a little bit more of. This is the gayest Perfect. Crush Club song what, to date. <laughs> to date. Yeah. What, what makes it the gayest Crush Club song? Um, It just feels like, you know, like dark club, like um, Does that sexy. Equal gay? <laughs> it equals gay. I mean, have you been to a straight? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And above, Sorry, and I just, everywhere. I'm, it makes me feel like I'm like in a back room, yes. you know, getting my dick sucked. Ooh. Oh, yeah. okay. Here we go on Snacky Tunes. Sloppy? Trust.
You have a DJ residency at Club Coming. Something sad has happened. What has happened? So, I guess, like, their neighbors or or something happened where... um, This is a classic New York tale. Yeah, it's like Like, the cabaret license thing, only it's like the performance license thing. And someone brought it to, like, the city's attention that they Mm -hmm. didn't have a license for DJs or live performances. And so, for the time being, they are shut down just for live stuff. They're still open, but yeah, any DJ or or like uh, live show nights have been indefinitely postponed. That said, the the residency there has been so fun. Yeah. Could, for for the uninitiated, yeah, and my parents, yeah. Yes. What is Club Coming? Club Coming is Eastern Block back. It's Eastern Block 2.0. So Eastern Block was a gay bar in East Village that went off when I was in college. Super sexy, fun, you know, stripper poles, go-go dancers. And then it mm-hmm. kind of got lame. And then as, Alan as Cumming... Things, as things do. As things do. Which is fine. And they were going to shut down. But then mm-hmm. Alan Cumming bought it and then turned it into Club Cumming. Which originated from his dressing room when he was on Broadway. He used to turn it into Club Cumming and made a little sign for it. And that's where it started. Is that true? That is very true. Ah, yes. yes. I'm just here to fill Was that in. during Cabaret? Uh, yes. I'm just here to fill in the facts. Thank yes, it was during you. To, so it's like he would invite people back and then that was Club Coming and someone made a sign and then like Cabaret closed and they're like, let's keep this going. Ah. And that's where the idea originated from. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I love Alan Cumming. He's the best. Um, also, like the only way you could get away with a ton of press with that name and be like, yep, yeah, well, that's his last name. Yeah. <laughs> Say what you will. Say what you will. Yeah, I don't, that's his I last. Don't I think, don't know what yeah. you're saying, but that's his last name. Just come. I inside. think a lot of people inside are taking it for face value. <laughs> yeah. You mean on the face value? On the face. Yes, value. all over the face in the mouth. But I mean, that is that is the thing about New York, where it is like something is so good, and a lot of people have a good time, and then there's one. I won't. I won't name the bar, but it's a well-known story about this uh, bar uh, that used to have this like ex DIY punk rock kid turned lawyer. Who then like system like systematically got them to roll back their hours, yeah. and it's like one person who moved in above a bar and then was upset that they moved in above a bar right. and then like kind of ruined it for everyone else. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, that's that's exactly what's going on here. It's so crazy to me when people move to a city, into a musical neighborhood, mm-hmm. and then a young expect neighborhood expect that it'll be nice and quiet for them. Right. Yeah, I don't understand. It will be in seven years. Just yeah. in the time. I, I feel like <laughs> I just feel that tomorrow. there's a social contract that you enter by coming, especially to New York. I mean, to other right. people, but like coming to New York, like, oh, it's loud. How are you surprised? Uh, right. Like, what did you actually want? Crazy. What did you want out of this city? Right. That's at all. Right. And then it's like, oh, here's a lot of people and a lot of people who can be marginalized or mm-hmm. not celebrated or pushing quarter who are just like living their lives. Right. And you're like, you know what? I don't like this. This represents everything I don't like, so I'm going to stop this. Right. Yeah. I wonder if um, I wonder if Alan Cumming is going to go to court over this. They made it seem like it was very like, oh, we just it's paperwork that we like missed and like it'll be solved in like ten days or like two weeks. (laughs) And you know what? The way they make shit happen, I kind of believe them. And Alan Cumming is kind of like. He's gonna get. He's, he's gonna like get a lord. Yeah. Of, he's like you know a god in New York, and I feel like he's gonna make it happen. And they made a good point. That's like this is a cultural hub. Like yeah. if you shut this down, you're like silencing people. Yeah, and I think that's true. And I and I don't disagree with it. I mean, Man. honestly, it's like that's where cabaret cabaret laws came from. It was to stop black people from dancing. I mean, it's right. like full right. stop. That's what it is. Yeah. I mean, like like look at all these people who are different, having a good time. Like we can't do racist stuff, so shut we'll be down. like, oh, shut it down. But like, I mean, we all went out. Like I, we dance, we spent our entire twenties and early thirties dancing. No one came and stopped it. That law got right. repealed six months ago. Right, it wasn't our parties that were getting shut down. I was so confused when I heard it was still a law. Right, because I was because like, oh. it was there for the use of that, or for things like right. things like this. It's interesting because right. New York is starting um, a nightlife task force too. Like, and they've shown that like nightlife mm-hmm. and this type of culture actually benefits the city and mass. It like does it on whole and it shows like it brings people it brings ideas together it like breaks down bears so then to do this for that's super public too yeah huh do they shame who the neighbor is you know i i think i might i don't know if i'm making the neighbor up but it felt like 
someone made it like known to the powers that be that that this was happening and then they got shut down like so I, I'm sure no one that actually goes to that bar like you know yeah. or works at that bar or like is around that bar like would ever bring attention to unless, this so unless someone got bounced like okay fine they got I'm dr- sure it's the person that pays four thousand dollars <laughs> for the one bedroom apartment right. above the bar or who someone, wanted Eastern Block to close and help to close or Oof. someone got drunk and was like I'll show them and like drunk child 311 and we're like who did I call <laughs> right. last night oh my god <laughs> I can't believe this is happening. Who oh, would do no. this? I'm sorry, Amanda Lepore. I'm sorry. Um, no I want to make sure you have an upcoming EP May, yes. May-ish? It's an ish. An ish. Yeah. Sometime this year-ish. Yeah, definitely. What, what can we expect on the upcoming EP? You'll hear two of these songs that we're playing today. Okay. We Dance and Trust. Um, three more unbelievable Perfect songs. Yes. <laughs> With non standard lyrics <laughs> that will touch the soul, but also shoot from the hip. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You think after. <laughs> yes. When you're humming it in the shower, you go, yeah. I do feel that way. And I do want to be free. I do want to be free. You yes. know what? I, I like it. I'm, I don't take it for granted. I don't. I like freedom. So this year ish, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to make sure we have time for one more song. Uh, where can people find you? Listen to your mini mix that is super mini super mix. mix. Climbing up the charts. <laughs> yeah. Where can people Storming find you? Storming up the charts right now. Um, so the super mini remix will be out in the next couple weeks on Tinted Records, which is an Australian dance label. And then the rest of our stuff that's released is on Spotify, SoundCloud, you know, YouTube. It's stuff. it's a miracle. If you actually look up Crush Club, Vowels In, uh, you'll find us. You will also find the like 2008 Teenage Nightclub. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so uh, cool. Where I was like, what I was doing, I was like, oh, okay. So I found a very certain amount of time in New York and Crush Club. <laughs> it's cool. We're going to leave it on that. Yeah, yeah. What's the name of the last song you're going to play for us? It's the first song we off. made. Yeah, yeah it's the first get me song. off. Yeah, first song we made, um, and it was a real great, like, you know, sometimes you make a tune, received well, everyone's like, yes, energy's right, and this this is the whole project just kickstarted. It was, felt great, and that it was a reason for everything. Perfect. Well, thanks for listening this week. Um, we appreciate you coming by. Thanks, thanks for letting me harass you uh, for a year <laughs> to come on the show. Oh. When the time is right, the time is right. Yes. You know? Shout out to everyone. Thanks for tuning in this week. We will be back next week with a new episode of Snacky Tunes. Take it away.
talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Snacky tunes is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.